Good day. I am Just the Guo, a licensed agriculturist currently affiliated with Alter Trade Philippines Foundation for Food Sovereignty Incorporated. Today, I'm going to discuss with you soil fertility and management. Maybe some of you are confused between land and soil. So, what really is the difference? Land is a part of the world that is not covered by water, while soil is a thin covering of the earth that consists of minerals, organic matter, air, and water. So land management concerns all operations, practices, and treatments used to protect the land and enhance the goods and services provided by the ecosystem the land is part of. While soil management is an integral part of land management and may focus on difference in soil types and soil characteristics to define specific interventions that are aimed to enhance the soil quality for the land you selected. So when we talk about land management, it covers the entire location. While for soil management, this focuses on the soil operations alone depending on your purpose of land use. For example, maybe it will be for crop production, for aquaculture, or for livestock raising. So the goal of soil management is to protect soil and enhance its performance so you can farm profitably and preserve environmental quality for decades to come. So it emphasizes sustainability so why is it important for us to protect the soil? Well, because soil is the basis of farming. Soil protects the quality of drinking water, air, and wildlife habitat. A healthy soil can filter and decompose organic substances such as manure, agricultural chemicals, and other compounds that can pollute air and water. Second, it delivers water and nutrients to crop. And third, it physically supports plants. Next, soil helps control pests. A healthy soil, high in organic matter and with a biologically diverse food web, support plant health and nutrition, better than soils low in organic matter. In addition to supporting vigorous growth of plants, better able to tolerate pest damage. And lastly, soil determines where rainfall goes after it hits the earth. Controlling water flow, that is the function of a soil. Our soil is composed of 20% air, 20% water, 5% organic matter, and 45% minerals. The mineral particles of soil may be composed of clay, sand, and silt. It depends on the ratio of these particles in the soil. Soil texture is the proportion of sand, silt, and clay particles that make up the mineral fraction of the soil. So we may refer a soil high in sand relative to clay as a light soil while a soil made up largely of clay is a heavy soil. So, how important is soil texture when we speak about soil management? Texture influences the ease with which soil can be worked, the amount of water and air it holds, and the rate at which water can enter and move through soil. On the other hand, soil structure is defined by the way individual particles of sand, silt, and clay are clustered. When these sand, silt, and clay are clustered, we call them aggregates. The circulation of water in the soil varies greatly according to structure. Therefore, it is important for you to know about the structure of the soil where you plan to build your farm. So what are the ways to improve soil structure? First, we have regular addition of organic matter. As we've said earlier, these organic matter, if decomposed, 
um, are being consumed by the microorganisms that help stabilize our soil structure. Second, minimum tillage. Minimal tillage means little to less disturbance. And this means that the ecosystem of the soil is being maintained. Next, compaction prevention. Because these heavy um, machines could compact the soil so we should avoid the entrance of these um, tractors to our farms next planting crops with dense roots when we say dense it means numerous roots so if there are numerous roots that goes into the soil we could have a good pore structure for our soil as you can see we have a water buffalo used in farrowing the farm before planting so this is one of our farmers and this is what they practice um, in their sugarcane farms when we say soil management we also consider the nutrient cycle so when we put plant residues and minerals these are being weathered and decomposed by soil, soil organism activities these transforms into humus and clay. So we call this colloid in the soil. Nutrients absorbed to colloids. So when we say absorbed, they stick to the colloids and they go through the soil solution. And after this, when you put a readily available fertilizer, a commercial fertilizer, they also stick into the soil solution. And when um, absorbed or when transformed rather these are being absorbed by the roots of the plants soil fertility it is the ability of the soil to sustain plant growth and optimize crop yield so when can we say that our soil is fertile first it has a good rooting environment in short the soil is not compacted and it has a lot of poor space Next, adequate water. You can see that there is a continuous flow of water in our soil. It is high in organic matter. It means the plants will be able to uptake more nutrients from these organic matter. Next, active soil community. Because no matter how much fertilizer we apply, if there are no microorganisms who will transform these into plant available forms, it is useless. Appropriate pH. Plant growth and most soil processes, including nutrient availability and microbial activity, are favored by soil pH that range from 5.5 to 8. To tell you this, soil fertility is not just the amount of the nutrients that we have in the soil, but whether plants can get the nutrients when they need them. So how do we improve the nutrient cycle? First, we have to add organic matter regularly. Second, we should observe minimum tillage. Third, compaction prevention. Fourth, fertilizer management. And lastly, planting deep-rooted crops and legumes. Why do we have to plant legumes? This is in order for our um, plants to absorb more nitrogen instead of it leaching away from the roots. So this is an example of how we intercrop mung bean, a legume, to the sugarcane farm. So after or within a week since planting, we start to plant the mung bean seeds. Let's talk about the water cycle. So first, infiltration is the rate at which water gets through the surface and into the soil. So with higher infiltration, more water will be available to plants and less will run off the surface, erode soil and wash away nutrients. That is why as we've talked about earlier, it is important that we have a good soil structure in order for the water to infiltrate into the soil instead of moving into the waterways. 
Next is the available water holding capacity. It is the amount of water soil can hold for plant use. So after the water gets into the soil, the surface tension of water holds it in soil pores against the pool of gravity. Organic matter also holds large quantities of water. Next, drainage or percolation. It is the excess water that soil can hold that moves out of the root zone so roots and organisms can get air. Many roots and soil organisms will die if the excess water does not quickly percolate out and allow air into the pores again. So here is a diagram of how the water cycles into the soil. So first, when the rain falls into the ground, it may infiltrate into the soil or run off the excess and then it may drain into the water table. So the water table is the depth where soil is always saturated. So the first picture is what we call a saturated soil wherein all pores are filled. Next, after a few days, there may be evaporation or transpiration. So we call the remaining water in the soil in, as a filled capacity. It is when about one half of pores are filled. If, as you can see, the water table is still saturated. Then if there are weeks of drought, you can say that your soil is on its wilting point because plants can't extract the remaining water because the roots no longer reaches the water table. So how do we improve water availability? First is the regular addition of organic matter. Next is trash mulching. So mulching is when we spread the trash on the or the crop residues on the soil where we removed these crops. So we place this in order to retain moisture and avoid direct heat from the sun. Next is compaction prevention. In order for the water to flow freely into the soil and next is erosion control. Because as we can see or remember, there is a runoff when there is um, uh, saturation into the soil. So in order to avoid this, we should observe erosion control like the sloping agricultural technology or the salt wherein we practice contour planting. Here is an example of trash mulching. On the left side, this um, the trash, the sugarcane trash are being spread on the field which will be planted anew. And on the right side is a ratoon sugarcane being piled with the trash to maintain its moisture and ecosystem. Next, let us talk about the soil ecosystem. It is constituted by dynamic, interactive, abiotic, or the non-living, and biotic compartments, the living organisms which are dependent on major key factors like water and light. So a perfect example is the soil food web. We should maintain the ecosystem in order for these organisms to survive or become predators of the um, natural enemies of these plants. Now, what are the ways to improve the soil ecosystem? First is regular addition of organic matter. Second, no burning or removal of crop residues from the field. Because through burning, you are killing the microorganisms that live in that soil. So therefore, the nutrient cycle and the maintenance of the structure of the soil is already being destructed. Next is increased diversity. And examples are, um, you may practice crop rotation, green manuring or companion cropping and lastly no application of toxic chemicals because it is just like you're killing these microorganisms 
Here is an example of how you could maintain the trash in your farm. So if you worry about the pests that might get attracted into the farm, you need not to worry because you could easily decompose these trashes by using a concoction or a natural, or na natural fertilizer. So in summary, this is how we manage our soil. First is regular addition of organic matter. Second, minimum tillage. Third, compaction prevention. Fourth, planting legumes and crops with dense and deep roots. Fifth, fertilizer management. Sixth, trash mulching. Seventh, erosion control. Eighth, no burning or removal of crop residues from the field. Ninth, increasing diversity and 10th no application of toxic chemicals so these practices are applicable to all especially those with big farms but the question is how about for those who have limited space or practice vertical gardening do they really need to follow this i could say it's a yes because um, you are also encouraged to manage your soil especially that um, you also need to ensure the cycle of the soil is efficient, that the nutrients are being taken by the plants and there is air circulation. So as uh, urban gardeners, you may practice trash mulching or covering your crops, with, uh, your crops in pots with um, rice straws or um, sawdust, but make sure that it is already dried. Next is increasing diversity by planting of companion crops or plants that could help um, avoid pests. For example, these uh, marigolds or these um, tanglad. Okay, next is um, no application or spraying of chemicals because uh, not only that it affects your health but also affects the um, the number of the soil organisms and also fertilizer management make sure that you do not um, add excessive fertilizers may it be organic or synthetic but we highly encourage you to use uh, organic fertilizers because it could enhance the soil structure. Next is organic matter addition. So you may add your um, non-oily uh, food wastes. You may let it decompose and mix it into your soil. You determine how your soil performs. Through your management choices, you change the structure, biological activity, and chemical content of soil and you influence erosion rates, pest populations, nutrient availability, and crop production. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening.